today one of our most important subjects when we are studying law is jurisprudence now the first thing that comes to our mind is why are we even studying a subject like that which has no sections no case laws nothing interesting and it's all very dry now the most important thing that we have to understand is that understanding the history of law how law came into picture how legal systems have arisen is very important so that you understand what law is exactly and where do we come from see the background is very important when you see a way ahead now if you want to do research you want to know more about how laws have progressed with changing times because times are changing even now so understanding jurisprudence it becomes an important part in that what is jurisprudence jurisprudence is philosophy of law or theory of law prudence means apply applying brain so there are certain schools of law which are prescribed in our syllabus which you may be attempting some of the questions in your examination what are these natural also called as analytical legal positivism historical sociological and realist we are going to see a few of them today and few of them in our next part now what happens is now what happens is we need to know why is jurisprudence important because we have to understand how society law and justice are interconnected with each other so one point that i have marked here importantly is role of law in the society if there is no law and order in the society you know what will happen there will be complete chaos so there has to be some rule some regulation something to put things in place now if you don't call somebody who is pickpocketing a thief or you don't prosecute him put him in front of the court before the judge then people will continue doing it all those who are doing it will also do and all those who are not doing it they will feel that's nothing wrong do in doing it so they will also start doing something of that sort now with changing times as i said why we are studying jurisprudence to understand how we have progressed a normal theft has been converted to cyber crime these days so the journey so far is what we know we need to know how this law came into picture in first place and most importantly how judicial system or legal system came into picture also uh, jurisprudence is important from a point of view that it gives us a framework for understanding the nature of law there are different types of laws if you go through your syllabus you will come to know there are lot of definitions that you will have to by heart that just in case you have to write an answer you will have to note them down also jurisprudence gives us the principles which are underlying the legal systems around the world now if you see in india we follow constitution and we have a set legal uh, system but in other countries not by the way in all countries around the world don't have constitution they have their own systems as well because not all countries are democratic they have different types of politics and they have many of them still have kings so they have their own systems so jurisprudence gives us a clear picture as to what happened across the world and how different systems have come into picture now uh, it's also important to know what are the objectives of jurisprudence if i'm not wrong in my saying this is one of the favorite questions of uh, at the exams of the paper setters why are you studying jurisprudence you need to know that so one is it encourages critical thinking and analytical skills so basically as i mentioned before if you are doing some research then you will come to know what is it about you will apply certain principles taken from the jurisprudence and take your research ahead so it's very important secondly it prompts individuals to question the foundation of law now what does this mean this just means that when you know that certain jurists certain legal thinkers have proposed a law or a system of law you can challenge 
or you can take the research ahead. So you can basic challenges what you can question the foundation of law. Next is uh, you can consider different perspectives. Now, as we know already, uh, as you must have studied before for your exams, jurisprudence gives us various thoughts. There are many jurists who have proposed a lot of other theories. So it's not just that one person has said something and people have taken his research ahead. No, they have given opposing views as well. So it gives us an opportunity to consider different perspectives about law, how law should progress ahead, and what is the next step that you can take with changing times in the society. Now, also, it is important to understand that there has to be certain kind of analysis. You can't just say that something can happen. It has to be realistic. It has to be applicable and it should be going in hand with the times and whatever is happening in the society, as I mentioned about cybercrime. So it engages in thoughtful analysis of legal issues. Not all theories are perfect, rather neither are perfect because everybody is doing research. Research can never be perfect. Anybody can get up and say, no, this is wrong and I'm challenging this under one, two, three, four. Now, if you see if you are uh, any time you have attended a trial, you might have noticed that uh, you challenge the prosecution story on the basis of facts, evidences, or you give judgments because you want to interpret the law as per your uh, case. So analysis, which is also thoughtful and something that is practical has to be put forth. So all this you will come to know only after knowing what jurisprudence is, what legal issues have arisen in the earlier theories that were proposed by the knowledgeable jurists. Also, if you see not only uh, some older jurists, we can also enlist certain justice of Supreme Courts of India who have proposed certain uh, not theories exactly, but certain they have tried to answer legal issues in their uh, judgments. And even today, we see that certain uh, judgments of the Supreme Court become a landmark judgment only for that reason, because they have given a new outlook or rather they have reiterated something that is very basic in nature. And it is said that, no, this is the right way. Now, if you go to see, there is a latest judgment of Supreme Court, which says no other custom, custom is a part of jurisprudence of the syllabus, no other custom is as important as Saptapadi when it goes to proving a marriage as per Hindu religion. And this is one of the latest judgments. So what I'm trying to say here is every theory is going to have certain issues. Issues means certain questions which you can answer, which you can question. So understanding jurisprudence in that case is very important. And last but not the least, it prompts ethical awareness of exploring relationship between law and morality. Now, being a criminal defense lawyer, one question that I repeatedly get from my students and other people who are not from law background, they ask me, what about ethics? What about moral values? You are defending a person who's done such and such crime. So is that right? Whatever the answer may be, as per jurisprudence, understanding the basic theories and concepts will help us to explore what is moral, what is law, and how they are connected, how justice can be delivered. Because one and the only important thing when you talk about law is justice should be delivered to the person who is a victim and who is suffered. So as I remember one of our noted Supreme Court uh, justices, he had said that people don't come here for fighting. They don't come here because they don't have anything to do in life. They come here for a solution and that's what we call justice. So that's very important. So for understanding all the intricacies of certain two, three elements that make an important part of justice delivery system, jurisprudence is the backbone of the whole thing. Now, 
there are certain definitions which are given in the textbook or otherwise when you go to read uh, there are a lot of books on jurisprudence as far as syllabus is concerned there are certain important definitions that i've tried to mention here one is it is a science of law now what does that mean science of law so what is the basic understanding of law that is jurisprudence as the science which deals with philosophy of law and system of law as i mentioned that the legal system is important. Nobody can just break in your house and steal something. Why? Because we have a system of law in place. That's what we call it as legal system. It is also a study of essential principles of law. It is a study of fundamental princip principles of law which are common to all systems of law. See, many there are certain elements which are interdependent on each other there is no sole uh, thing or element justice law moral values ethics changing times everything is interdependent on each other now even i may say technology why because as i mentioned about cyber crime when there was no technology there was no mobile phone there was nothing called as hacking right so things have changed and thus technology, society, everything is dependent on each other for understanding law and for justice delivery. Also, it is a consists of various laws such as criminal, somebody must have defined it as uh, it containing various laws such as civil, criminal, constitutional, administrative. These are certain uh, parts as we know in law. You, you might always be hearing that it's civil law, criminal law, corporate law. So it's all about that. Now, there was some great jurist called Salmon. I have put his uh, definition here. Jurisprudence in the name given to certain type of investigation. Now, he focuses mainly on investigation and that too of an abstract, general and theoretical nature. Now, I'll tell you one good thing about jurisprudence that all these definitions you just have to remember understand the keywords of the definition or the theory proposed by the certain jurist and remember that Be otherwise there is nothing else to do in jurisprudence subject for your syllabus and examinations also at the same time i would like to mention that uh, that's what i have come to know that students are very afraid of jurisprudence when it comes to examinations because there are so many theories. But remember, your paper is not going to be solely uh, relating to theories only. You will have other questions from customs, property, possession. There are certain other topics as well in this subject. If you do them well, I'm sure you will really get good marks. There are certain theories which are important just understand them. Remember, when it comes to long answers, what you're supposed to do is you should remember who said what. Now, we'll see a few today uh, theories. Okay. So, there is another jurist who uh, called us Ulpe, who told that jurisprudence is knowledge of things. So, he's basically connecting uh, just and unjust, human and divine, how things, according to him, brought law into picture. So jurisprudence for him is distinguishing between uh, two different things. Now you cannot say that they are opposite. Just and unjust is opposite, but human and divine is not really opposite. So I mentioned that. And the third person I have mentioned here is Joe Lewis. Now he says that jurisprudence is a general theoretical discussion as we understand it as a subject in our syllabus. Now there are four other Allen, Holland and Dicey. Now I remember that these three are important because somehow they put forth something different. Now if you see Allen, he talks about scientific synthesis. So basically what he is trying to do is he is trying to analyze what jurisprudence is and how law came into picture. According to him, everything is a set format. And it is a very scientific method of understanding essential principles of what? Of law. Now, as far as Holland is considered, he talks about science itself. But he is a proposed 
proponent of form science of positive law. For this, you will have to know what is positive law. But for now, you just remember that he is a, a person, he is a jurist who proposed form science. Dicey was a person uh, who really thought that jurisprudence is the word that stings in the nostril. He thinks that it's of no use. And for uh, barristers, he had given a totally different thought as compared to other jurists of his time. So Dicey had a very opposing views that you may remember. And last but not the least, Dr. Setna. You should read this because he thinks that it is the study of fundamental legal principles, which is simply put in a very beautiful manner, which includes philosophical thought, historical thought, sociological thought, which he has called as a base for study and analysis of legal concepts. So there are certain legal concepts as we know. For analysis of these concepts, he thinks that jurisprudence is important and study of jurisprudence will in turn help us to understand these legal concepts. Okay, so now we have come to one of these theories which were proposed by someone called as Kelson. And he proposes Kels Kelson's theory of pure science of law. Now, what does he mean by that? He defines science as a system of knowledge or a totality of cognitions systematically arranged according to logical principles. So basically, he tries to say here that for him, law is nothing but science. It is a system of understanding. And he has not favored any time the widening of scope of jurisprudence. Many of other jurists have done that. So we are mentioning it here that he is not in favor of widening the scope. So basically, some people feel that jurisprudence could have wider scope and it could go on changing or increasing as time permits. But Kelson thinks it's not true. That does not happen. Also, he relates his theory of law with politics, sociology, metaphysics and other extra legal principles as well. So he thinks that politics, uh, all that is happening in the society, sociology is basically understanding and study of social changes, social behavior, society, people, etc. So he correlates every other element or uh, extra legal disciplines with law. And what he did was, uh, there is a jurist called John Austin, who was in 19th century, he proposed something called as analytical jurisprudence. And he revived the theory of Austin and said that, okay, this is what is right. And he took it ahead as research for himself. And he has proposed the theory of pure science of law. And he wanted to keep it very objective. He didn't, as I mentioned, it's, there's no scope for widening of jurisprudence, as he mentioned. So he has kept it very objective and he has not included, that's what divested means. He has not included any moral, ethical or ideal element. So basically, uh, he thinks that it's very pure. That's why it's mentioned, I have mentioned theory of pure science of law. So it's very objective for him. One is one and one cannot be interpreted in any other manner. That's what he says. So next is natural law theory. Now this is an a priori method which is different from empirical method. You need to read a little bit since jurisprudence is too vast. It's not possible to uh, include each and every term or each and every part of jurisprudence. But Today, I am giving you a very fair and uh, good outline as to how and what is jurisprudence. And also, I am in between telling you how to study these. As I mentioned, you should know certain uh, theories of law. So, I have mentioned these. Natural law theory is another one that I have considered here. Because it's a, I think it's a part of your uh, examination. It's most asked kind of a question. Now, it symbolizes physical law of nature, which is based on moral ideals. We saw that Kelson was not at all in favor of any moral ideals. 
but here in natural law theory yes it is considered and it has universal applicability at all places and times now does it really apply that's not our question the question is that the theory believes that it is universally applicable at all times and places so don't get confused with certain questions in your mind as to whether this is applicable even now whether this uh, is sustainable even today we are not really uh, trying to focus on that we are trying to focus on what the theory has told you so as far as your examination and papers and uh, your study is concerned understand that jotting down i think your this ppt will be shared with you on your request jotting down certain important points of that theory remembering them properly and writing them in your answer papers will be sufficient for you to get through and i think you will score well enough it's not just the borderline you will do well but you have to remember certain keywords as i mentioned earlier as well so in this uh, theory natural law theory you will have to remember that is an it is an a priori method and what it a priori method is what because it they say that it is different from the empirical method which existed at that point in time also you will have to remember that it symbolizes physical law of nature natural law so you will remember that it's physical law of nature and uh, it considers moral ideals now moral ideals and law and uh, nature and everything so obviously it is universally applicable that's what the theory says also it says that it is often used to defend a change or to maintain a status quo so whatever that is happening or maybe some change that is happening it defends that that's what that's why they say that it is applicable at all times and all places that's what the theory proposes you have to use certain words in your answers so that the paper checker gets a confidence that you know what you are writing so you can write the theory proposes the theory states don't use normal uh, language that we talk in day to day life okay so use these keywords and underline if you have time at the end if you are left with say 5 to 7 minutes uh this will happen only with practice trust me this is not something out of the world that i'm telling you uh many people don't even finish their papers till the end of the 3 hours but many people if you see at least one or two you may have in your uh, examination hall center uh, that the person finishes every paper 5 minutes prior to the bell rings and then the person is rechecking the answers or something and yes this is possible i mean it's not something that is impossible no ma'am what are you saying this is not possible it is possible i have done it so i remember uh, marking with pencil or with pen these keywords what happens is the paper checker doesn't have time to read all the stories okay there are good papers there are bad papers there are bad handwritings so people are very you know stressed out even reading papers but if you have underlined no matter how your handwriting is forget that towards the end when you are in a rush to finish up your paper even a good handwriting becomes a very very bad handwriting so um when you underline those keywords or important points the paper checker will just read those words understand that you know what you have written you have written the right thing and he will give you marks and go ahead with checking your rest of the paper so it becomes very easy for him and it will become beneficial for you while it comes to scoring marks so do that practice uh, write answers write long answers at home without a timer and then try to you know remember the important points and then write without looking at the answer and with a timer so you will finish your paper at least within time you will not regret leaving behind one big question which is almost 20 marks if i'm not uh, so coming back to the natural law theory it also considers development of human rights and basic rights now what are human rights and basic rights i need not explain here but as far as india is concerned as i mentioned other different countries have different laws and legal systems 
for them human rights are different in nature but and how they implement is again another issue or a question as far as that country is concerned but as far as india is concerned human rights and basic rights are nothing but all those rights and freedoms mentioned in the constitution of india wherein you might have repeatedly heard about article 21 right to life and it embodies lot of other uh, rights even such something such as a uh, right to sleep you might have not heard there is a landmark judgment you can go and read so basically natural law theory also proposes that human rights and basic rights are developed and they have to be developed so it considers at least other theories if you see they will not even mention anything about basic rights forget human rights right so natural law theory is a very as you can say it's a modern uh, kind of a theory where it considers certain things now next point is with relation to that itself embodies within its values of reason justice morality and ethics i mentioned something about morality and ethics a while ago so even in natural law theory it proposes that such elements should be considered and are a part of law now many theories if you see they are very harsh very rash they say no this is this if you have committed theft uh, you deserve to die there are certain countries in the world that uh, if you might have read uh, there is one sort of uh, punishment where the person who is found guilty of whatever offenses he is tied with a rope to a huge uh, log of wood in something called as chok okay in the middle of a big street or a place or a ground and people whoever are coming and going it is declared okay that the person is convict and he is held to be committing such and such crime everybody starts throwing stones you might have seen this in movies also it is very dramatically pictureized in movies but yes this exists in some corner of the world this is still going so they throw stones at the person and eventually because of loss of blood and all those hurts the person dies now as far as india is concerned and many other developed and developing countries this is considered as a very inhuman uh, conviction or uh, punishment so natural law theory is the one which proposes uh, something called as human rights basic rights and also it includes within itself values of reason justice ethics etc now why reason because if you say something you have to have a valid reason now say for example you if you lie to your mother there has to be a reason behind it such a reason which is not harmful to others so reasoning has been an important part of the indian judiciary system since constitution was created now uh, if you see you might have read certain judgments or at least you've heard every judge right from the trial court till the supreme court has to give a reasoning for why the judgment was passed in the manner that it was passed now if you are saying that the person is convicted under section say 420 for cheating then he has to give a reason as to what was the evidence presented before the court what were the witnesses examined and how it came into clarity that the person has committed the crime so he has to give those reasons he just can't say he is convicted under 420 for cheating so reasoning is a very important part in natural law theory i think you should remember this element very importantly you should remember it for your exams when you start writing your answers because no other theory will give you a strong opinion about holding a value of reasoning in uh, jurisprudence as far as this subject is concerned now also if you uh, see read my last two points natural law theory has given rise to concept of rule of law in india and england now what is rule of law it just means that there has to be a law and order in the land so that nothing goes awry nothing creates a chaos and there has to be a system in place wherein people should be afraid of committing any crime 
and also at the same time people should have faith in the system that they will get justice of course now we have gone a little we have drifted a little away from uh, this saying but yes law believes in delivering justice for the victim and punishing the person who has committed wrong so rule of law is the gist of rule of law is this and the same thing is what in usa they called as they call as due process so there has to be a certain system in place it has to be a due process means a process which has certain reasons which has certain elements which should be considered not that it should be just a uh, one sided so you know both the people should get chance to represent themselves both the persons to both the parties should get an opportunity to put forth their evidence so this is basically a due process that what usa follows it's very much similar to what rule of law is in india and england so as we saw at length natural law theory is something that is applicable in today's time and what countries are following so now this is one of the most important theories if you see uh, kelson austin and professor hart now professor hart's theory of law is quite important it keeps coming in the examination papers if i'm not wrong i think even i had this question in my paper i don't remember whether i attempted it or not but yeah this is a very interesting theory which proposes something called as legal positivism now professor hart has been a very important person uh, because he opposed austin's theory of coercive power so basically austin's theory proposes that there is a sovereign sovereign means the state and they have certain power and they can use it at their uh, wish that's not not that to, to that extent but yes that's what he believes in in his theory of law and professor hart had the heart to oppose this theory now understand uh, austin was a very famous and uh, well known jurist who had proposed that theory and many people Uh, said okay this is right so it had to have some guts to oppose the theory now how different is professor hart's theory let's see that so he says that in his view laws are rules basically and they are made by humans so everybody has to be included in it it cannot just uh, say that the king says okay he has committed crime put him in jail no so he thinks that everybody has his own uh, say kind of a contribution to making of law of any land and he also proposes to include political philosophy and moral philosophy just as we saw in natural law theory he also says that a little bit of philosophy from politics and morality should be included moral science also he states that there is no inherent or necessary connection between law and morality now though he proposes that moral philosophy should be included he says that there is no connection there is no vital connection between law and morality people can still follow law and be immoral and we have seen lot of cases as far as this theory is concerned you might have seen that people are very uh say they commit a crime and they hide it well so law doesn't mean justice law is a set of rules and that has got no nothing to do with morality is what professor hart has proposed in his theory now also interestingly it provides for concept of existence of a legal system now he says that there is a certain legal system there is hierarchy there has to be certain element uh which should coincide with each other no other theory if you see uh believes in the existence of a legal system and though it says or talks about the existence of legal system it mentions uh it doesn't really formally examine the concept of authority as i mentioned that he opposes austin's theory of coercive power but coercive power is concept of authority but he doesn't examine that 
in his theory. So somewhere people felt that uh, his theory is a little uh, not very convincing because if you are opposing certain theory or research or you are challenging a certain rule, then you should be able to propose a rule which should have a basis and you should examine the theory well. Now, in his theory, this is one important part that you should remember that it doesn't formally examine the concept of authority. Yes, so we come to Austin's theory. So now there was a jurist called Bentham. He has done a lot of writing on uh, jurisprudence. It is impossible to not know Bentham if you have even read or seen something called as jurisprudence. So what Austin did is he was very much uh, convinced with Bentham's theory and he took his work ahead. So he proposed that law is command of the sovereign as we discussed earlier, coercive power of the sovereign. And he believes that it's a science concerned with exposing principles, concepts and differences common to different legal systems. So obviously there are certain legal systems which are different, but there, then there are certain differences which are in common to them. So say two, three systems are placed side by side. If you are uh, analy analytically trying to understand, then you will see that certain common differences are there in these theories. And he is saying that uh, jurisprudence or his theory is a science that tries to understand that. Exposing means understanding and taking research ahead. So exposing the principles of jurisprudence or con uh, understanding concepts of jurisprudence is his basic uh, theory. Now every theory has an aim. So his theory's aim is this. Also he tries to say that it is a social fact. According to him, jurisprudence is a social fact and that means that it can change because society will change. You can't say that anything is static, right? And it also it reflects relations of power and obedience. Understand Austin is talking a lot about power. So power and obedience. So the king is going to say within my power, so and so thing is right, so and so thing is wrong. And the person, whoever is standing in front of him, he has just to nod his head and obediently follow his orders. So basically he's talking as we mentioned in earlier slide, he is talking about not only power, but coercive power. What does coercion mean? Compulsion. So he tries to study uh, in his theory. He is proposing that it's also a relation between power and obedience. Also, concepts of rights and obligations, property, possession, personality. Now, you might property, um, personality, all these are important elements in law. But surprisingly, though Austin proposes something called as coercive power and sovereign power, he also includes concepts of rights and obligations. Obviously, when you have a right to do something, you have a freedom to do something, you have a duty also, right? So that's what is rights and obligations. So say, for example, you have the right to play uh, loud music at your home. But you are also under an obligation, a social obligation I'm talking about here, is that you should not be disturbing the other people in your society, which is fair enough. So you enjoy your right, but you cannot step on to someone else's rights. You cannot violate others' rights. So that is what obligations means. Now, uh, the next theory is Indian legal theory. When everything of this sort was happening in the world, what was India doing? So that's the answer here, that Indian legal theory was always based on certain text, scriptures, certain old uh, books, right? Uh, such as scriptures, there are other writings as well, left behind by some great people whom we call seers, sages. There were people who were very knowledgeable and they have written a whole system. Now, you might have heard about uh, from the TV series and movies, you might have heard about something called as Ram Rajya. Why do they call Ra Ram Rajya? Because during the time of Ramayana, when King Ram was ruling, that time it is said that it was a perfect legal system. There was no crime. Everybody was happy. Everybody had enough food to feed themselves, enough money 
to do whatever they wanted of course the needs uh, were lesser at that time of people as compared to what we want now uh, needs or rather wants so but at that point in time everybody was very happy the country was flourishing and everything was very beautiful and nice now why was it because there was a good legal system in place of course people and thoughts of people have changed with times but certainly there was something in place which helped them to rule in a proper fashion or in a structured manner so we always believed in the concept of dharma now wh where does this dharma come from if you know uh, the oldest maybe many more um, even before that but the, in bhagavad gita lord krishna talks about dharma and even in law even today if you read the sanskrit taglines of our uh, police department or our judiciary system you will realize that there is this word called dharma so we all as indians believe that doing your job well believing in good doing good to people doing good deeds is what is important and we believe that it is my uh, say for example it is something that is so important and it is an intricate part of indian culture that we believe in dharma it is my obligation to do good to others or rather deliver justice so concept of dharma has taken a lot of uh, connotations as far as uh, say police judge lawyers you know i am talking only about the judiciary system is concerned now here this theory talks about certain indian jurists you can read the names manu narada jamini and yajnavalkya yajnavalkya is someone you will come to know about in your personal laws a lot he talks about property how it should be given to the ancest uh, ancestral property how it can be given to the uh, people in the family how it can be divided etc etc so you will come to know about him from there but he has also been a part of the uh, legal theory that is been given here also it includes certain ancient hindu legal thinkers of those times uh, now this theory basically uh, is based on sound principles of reasoning we say that everything can be interpreted now you must have heard about this guy called birbal okay also there was a king in south who had someone like birbal tenaliram so why were they there wasn't there any legal system why every king had a very smart and you know somebody who can interpret the situation the facts that were given circumstances and our judiciary system of that time legal system was based on reasoning even today as i mentioned reasoning has to be given by the judge but at those point in times there were these thinkers or rather smart guys in their courts of uh, kings who used to analyze situations go find out uh, what ac actually happened what was exactly the situation is the victim telling the truth so all these kind of things used to happen uh, that's the reason why india was one of the most prosperous countries in the world at that point in time when people were struggling to understand what law is uh, also as i mentioned while talking about dharma uh, this le legal theory indian legal theory focuses a lot on human welfare now if in today's time as well if you see uh if there is any family matter in the court what the judge will think the supreme good has to be done to the child of the fighting parents you will also come across in uh, your subjects when you go ahead in your studies that the child should be given most benefit anyway parents are fighting but that should not affect the present and future life of the kid so we always as indians have believed that human welfare is of utmost importance so this legal theory proposes that and of course there is a jurist called uh, a legal thinker rather called main he had written in his book that 
Indian legal theory is oldest pedigree of any known system of jurisprudence in the world because uh, there are certain texts and scriptures such as you might be aware of Arthashastra written by Chanakya. It was one of the best systems that had been given in the times of Gupta period. If you read about it, you will come to know how legal system was put in place, how and why people progressed at that point in time. So, uh, of course, Indian legal theory is very important. Uh, you may get a question on this in your examinations because it is very different from how others have proposed theories as science. Uh, somebody talks about sovereign power. Somebody is opposing that. But Indian legal theory is totally different. We are talking not about religion. We are talking about our uh, obligations, our duties, rather than our rights and freedoms. Dharma, now when you talk about dharma, it is my duty to do good. It is my duty to look after my parents. It is my duty to uh, look after my younger brothers and sisters. So all this is what is dharma, doing good, etc., etc., like, if you might have read, do your karma well and leave the rest to God. That's what we believe. It's not about Hinduism. It's about your duties uh, as to how you should perform in the society. How should you be a good citizen in the society so that others also benefit and at the same time they are not troubled. Committing a crime is what? Why does, see now in criminal trials, why is it state versus XYZ? Why, how did state come into picture? XYZ might have stabbed some person A. So why is it state versus XYZ? Because if he has done it to some single person, he might be able to do it to some other person also. If he's caught free, he will think, okay, this is not going to punish me and I'm uh, living as I wanted to live. Let me stab a few more people, grab some of their properties and live like a rich man. Is that right? No. So... It is uh, the essence of life is given in dharma where it says that you should be dutiful towards not only your family, your friends, but all people around you. So uh, that's the basic, uh, I can say, backbone of our legal theory even today. If you notice all judgments and all, all those trials and whatever uh, cases are going on in the courts, you will notice this coming up again and again. Even our uh, Supreme Court justices talk about dharma in some or the other judgment of this. So you can go through this nicely. Now law and justice. What is this concept? How they are interdependable? Are they really dependable? Whether if say you go to the court, will you get justice? Is following law going to give you justice? Is uh, breaking laws uh, going to not uh, give you the privilege of doing something or is it that they are not related to anything? So this is one uh, question which tries to explore the interdependability or the connection between law and justice. Okay, so what is justice basically? Something that is just fair, right? And it should be impartial in nature. Say if you try to say that one person is right and naturally you are saying that the other person is wrong. But if you say this only because the right person is say my friend and the other person is not, is that impartial? No, it's partiality. Everybody I see right in TV ads also, people keep talking about nepotism. You might have heard even spoken about. So that's partiality, right? That's what we are talking about. So justice has to be impartial. You have to listen to both the sides, see what is wrong, what went wrong, were the circumstances such. Say, for example, A stab B. But it could be the case that B tried to fire a gun at A. Now, just to save his own life, A tried to defend himself and he stabbed B. So would you say A has committed crime? No, if you consider only the fact that he stabbed B, it is a crime. But when you consider the circumstance underlying that certain incidents, then you realize that he was provoked. It is 
uh, it comes under a defense called as grave and sudden provocation. So he has done the act only to defend himself, right? So then that doesn't become a crime. So you have to listen to both the facts, both try to understand the circumstances and then come to a conclusion. That's what is impartiality. So justice, when, why do you call Supreme Court judge justice? That's the reason because it is considered as the supreme, the epitome of impartiality where uh, fair decisions are taken, which are right, which are just in nature. So justice means that. Now, what is being just? It depends upon the context. As I told you about the example of A stabbing B, the circumstance. So the context is very important, but its requirement is essential to the idea of justice. Obviously, because um, nothing can be just if it is not told in that manner, right? So you have to present that thing in such a manner that you have to put across your thought or what had actually happened. So then only justice can be delivered. Next is, uh, if you see in law and justice, it tries to explore all the concepts, whether they are delivering the right thing or not. For example, natural school of law proposes implementation of religious laws. Whereas modern day uh, jurisprudence, uh, the thought behind it, is recognition and implementation law made by legislatures. So, but nevertheless, if you see and analyze, even if it natural school is an old school kind of a, a theory and modern day is a today's times theory, you will understand that both of them talks about laws. Where there is law, it should be fair. And by implementation of laws, the justice can be delivered. That's what both of them propose. Their ways, their pathways are different. But the end point is the same. Now, law and justice, if you get this question as to critically analyze the concept of law and justice, you have to mention two, three theories. Try to explain what is law. Try to explain what is justice. If you can buy her two definitions, each one, uh, one of law and one of justice proposed by some person, uh, some personality, some jurist, then you may write that and try to explain what is law and justice. Try to explain um, as far as I understand, you should also be able to give your own input as to what it means. Like I said, A stab B, that's an example. So you can give such an example. You can also write some, uh, I know jurisprudence doesn't really give scope to write sections and judgments. But if you can explain the concept and interdependability of law and justice in some judgment, if you have, you can write that, trust me, that will make a mark on the paper checker's mind that this person has really put in efforts to study jurisprudence. Okay. Also, I've mentioned three here. One is natural school, other one is modern law, and third is Roscoe Pound. Now, he was also one fellow who told us about what jurisprudence is. You can uh, go through his theory, but all the questions that I got for your uh, from your examination point of view, Roscoe Pound was not really uh, found there. It may come in some short note, which is like a five uh, five marks question, if I'm not wrong. So what Roscoe Pound talks is that he thinks that laws to mean uh, principles that public tribunals recognize and enforce. So basically, he's talking about tribunals means uh, it's a court, right? Uh, we have tribunals now. What he meant at though that point in time should be court only. So he is basically talking about the legal system in place, and there is a court, there is a judge, there is a lawyer. So there are two lawyers who defend both the parties, and then justice is delivered. So according to him, law and justice is thus uh, interdependable. So when you explain and express your thoughts on what law and justice through these principles, these theories, your ideas, I think you will be able to write a very good answer. Next. So now, uh, this is one of the most favorite questions of the paper setters. Trust me, I remember attempting this question. Did this had come in my exam? I have also seen the, this question as a very favorite question at LLM examination for criminal law. 
so theories of punishment now uh, you have to remember these theories uh, you have to remember the names understand what it means and write it in your words so one is deterrent theory deterrent means what to stop okay so you are deterring somebody from doing something that only means that you are stopping the person from doing that act now for example say you have a very very simple uh, words i'll put it to you have a habit of eating a lot of sugary stuff okay you want uh, you want sweets all the time say you want laddu pedas all the time you love sweets and your mom will stop you from eat overeating these kind of things why because it is not good for health but as a kid you don't understand that now of course you know i am talking about when you were kids so your mom knows right that it's not good for my uh, kid in longer run so she will try to stop you in many different ways from you, know, you eating those sweets at, at like large scale so she may use certain uh, techniques to stop you uh, to deter you from eating that so now here theories of punishment we are talking what deterrent theory means is some theory uh, it is some sort of a punishment i'm sorry some sort of a punishment that stops the person from committing a crime say for example there is a high fence and in these days if you know there is something called as electric fence so when you put the electric fence if you go and touch it you will feel that electric shock so what are you trying to do you are trying to deter the thief from entering your property now whether that uh, electric fence is allowed in our country or no is for something for you to read and know but i am talking about certain uh, techniques that can be used to deter so punishments certain punishments can be given that can stop the person from committing the crime now i know some judges believe that uh, certain criminals should not be given bail and they deserve to stay inside the judicial custody for a long, longer period of time not because they hate them <laughs> but because they think that if they are inside people outside are safer let them enjoy the festivals let them wear gold jewelry uh, go without any worries so basically they are deterring by holding them inside they are deterring them from committing the crime now this is a very loose example of course but you have to go through these uh, theories to write in your paper since you have seven points if you write even a bit here and there then it will cover up your uh, long answer i'm very sure uh, next is retributive theory uh, uh, third one is preventive now deterrent and preventive is little similar but when you see that preventive theory could be like tying the person okay now for example uh, you might have heard about solitary confinement now that these people who have committed like say high profile crimes or they are uh, not even like you know able to stay with people inside the jail so i remember one person who was in jail for some other crime and he started fighting with his inmates they are called inmates uh in the people those uh, all those criminals who are inside the jail with him so what happened is he uh, hit someone and other person so he hurt two people so then what the what did the police do they just put him in solitary confinement so that's a single room where he is kept alone and he is not given the leeway of coming out except for some reasons so uh, that's absolutely preventive in nature so that he doesn't hurt anybody else inside as well so that's deterrent is a little uh, lesser having lesser gravity and preventive in preventive in nature is exact in nature so that you don't uh, i mean give him an opportunity at all kind of uh, fourth is expiatory fifth is reformative reformative is very interesting you can write a little bit on this uh, it being a form of punishment which tries to reform the person from within now if you have read gandhi ji's uh, what's that called ba philosophy uh, he believed in reformation of a person from within so here we are believing that a criminal should be given an opportunity he should be given 
such a punishment so that he doesn't commit the crime himself now we telling a kid don't do this don't do this he is going to do that many more times remember that but if we show him a way wherein he stops doing it he should feel that i shouldn't be doing this so we uh, that's a method next is restorative justice and last one is reformative techniques in juvenile justice so these are certain forms of punishment which are given in uh, different countries uh, corporal flogging mutilation fines uh, deportation that is uh, say if a person a bangladeshi is in india without a visa uh, extension he is sent back to his country so that's called deportation and lastly is uh, imprisonment imprisonment for life etc now last topic is custom now this is one of the favorite in uh, examinations you can uh, go through this now what's a customs custom is something that is uh, been going on for a long time in the society okay so as i mentioned about saptapadi in hindu marriage it's a custom so different communities have different customs and um, It not not only marriage, different things, and that's a source of law. So you may get a question uh, such as custom as a source of law. Now this is one of the oldest sources of law making. Uh, also, its roots lies in uh, scriptures written by Manu. And you might have seen that uh, certain justices do do refer to this even today when it gives uh, comes to giving judgments. Okay, so there are four distinct stages. and um, we believe in um, all that was said by rishi munis shruti smritis uh, these are certain scriptures that are available for uh, say reference and from there custom came into picture now when there was nothing no law in the land there was only customs that people used to follow so custom has been a very age old source of law what are the kinds of custom K kinds of custom are conventional and legal two uh, kinds and conventional is something that is distinguished from usage now something that is used for a longer time doesn't become a custom this is also a favorite short note if i am not wrong by the uh, paper checkers sorry paper setters uh, something that is used for a long time usage of a certain uh, belief is not a custom but a custom is has to have a continuous usage so conventional custom other one is legal custom where one is local and other one is general general which is followed by a large group of people and local could be which is uh, be believed or followed only by a part of the general public say a community so for example the tribal community of so and so place follow so and so custom so that becomes a local custom so you might when your personal laws when you read and uh, learn about marriages you will come to know that there are various customs that they follow during uh, marriage so there is a you might have uh, you know about dowry right the girls parents give dowry to the boys father parents for getting married but you will be surprised to know that there is a certain community where the boys parents give dowry to the girls parents to get the girl married in the house so there are certain different customs within india okay it's not in some other country so this is a local custom basically it's not followed generally by everybody right and uh, next is theories of custom so these are the two types of theories of customs historical and analytical you need not know more about it but when you attempt an answer on custom you should mention write at least one line as to what is historical and what is analytical certainly if you just from the words you can guess historical is something which has historical background something was in the past and analytical is a little modern thought where it uh, gives scope for analysis means research so what are the requisites of a valid custom now this is also a very important uh, question from the university uh, that the custom cannot be said to be valid unless these require uh, elements are proved so one is reasonableness it can't be unreasonable okay second is consistency consistency means it has been followed by four generations in our community so that is consistency also which uh, says about 
continuity continuity and immemorial antiquity so basically our five generations have been following this you might have uh, seen this in some south indian movies where they tell some age old story or legendary story and then they say oh this is going on in our community for say like five six generations i don't even know from where and um, it's going on this is a custom of our community so that talks about immemorial antiquity okay and compulsory observance so basically if that element is not observed if that thing is not observed as a custom it is like a big sin in the community so you might have uh, heard a lot of examples if you see northeast india i think they have many um, all those places who are inhabited by tribals they have their own customs you may see different uh, nose rings ear rings they have a lot of other uh, different customs that they follow even today so that's compulsorily observed by each member of the community otherwise if you don't want to follow it you get lost from the community that strict there and last but not the least certainty so if there is no certainty and if there is no reasonableness then it that custom so called custom that is followed by the community is not valid as per law so here we are not talking or exploring about the customs of uh, people in the communities but whether these customs are considered when it is uh, when it comes to court of course in today's time like i mentioned saptapadi is a custom but it is valid as per hindu marriage when it comes to the court in proving that the boy and the girl were married so certainty and reasonableness are two important elements that you should remember consistency continuity you will be able to write it is a bit of a general nature okay sumeda so, so thank you so much for so beautifully explaining today's topics it was very simple explanation and yes we could easily understand everything thank you so much welcome